Thank you all for coming out. Uh, what a terrific audience on a gorgeous uh, October Oregon day. It's a, a pleasure to see you all here. Um, so we are here to talk about the rebirth of East Germany since 1990, uh, which is a fascinating topic. Um, we're here as part of the Citizenship and Crisis Initiative. Uh, I'm Chris Nichols, I'm a history professor here at OSU, and I also have the pleasure of directing our Center for the Humanities. Uh, and I helped to found the Citizenship and Crisis Initiative a few years ago, uh, in 2014, uh, we began by taking the centenary of World War I as a starting place to think deeply about uh, questions of citizenship, rights, obligations, limitations, changing definitions, uh, and issues of global as well as national uh, citizenship. And so we'll be hearing uh, something today that touches on a wide range of topics uh, at the intersection of citizenship in different nation states, in the EU, in Germany, around the world, and that has real ramifications, I think, for what's going on in the US today. Uh, first, I always thank uh, our partners, uh, College of Liberal Arts, Dean Larry Rogers, uh, the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion, Nicole von Germaden, uh, amazing, Natalia Bueno, who's behind the camera right now, uh, and uh, Suzanne Giftai. Our lead intern uh, is uh, Amber Tolrud here, uh, also uh, worth thanking. Uh, and we run lots of different kinds of programs. I've seen lots of you here before, but it's worth just briefly noting the kinds of things we do. We're a program of kind of engaged democracy. Uh, we try to bring the best insights from history, from the humanities to wider audiences, to provoke thought, to generate uh, new kinds of relationships to those ideas, and then ultimately to make better human beings in society, more engaged uh, citizens, more engaged members of the community. Um, we run events, film screenings, we do panel discussions, we bring in speakers from Germany, from around the world, from around the US, from the state of Oregon. We do events in Corvallis, and Bend, and Portland, and elsewhere. So be on the lookout for some of the things we're up to. Uh, in the coming months, we'll have a speaker from American University, Sarah Snyder, uh, on human rights in a global context and citizen activism. Uh, we'll have May Nye, who's a major immigration scholar, coming through as a partnership with the University of Oregon, We're holding a huge international conference in May and June of next year on ideology and U.S. foreign policy, with 20 scholars from around the world coming in and a keynote on Trump and ideology. So don't miss that. Uh, and I could go on and on. But uh, we're not here to just hear about what's coming up. We're here to uh, talk about the rebirth of East Germany since 1990. Uh, the talk this evening really presents a superb example of the sort of programming that we do and want to do. Um, a few ground rules. Uh, silence your phones, please. I'm always amazed back at faculty meetings and students' phones go off. We should all know better, but we don't, unfortunately. So silence phones. If you have to leave surreptitiously, quietly, please do so. That's totally fine. Um, Generally speaking, our talks are about 50 minutes, and then we have Q&A for however long, maybe 30 minutes, so uh, keep that in mind as we're thinking about uh, where we're headed here. Uh, and um, uh, let me now introduce our presenter. How about that? Uh, Dr. Thomas Fuchs uh, grew up in the border region of East Germany. I'm interested to learn more about why he hyphenates East Germany, so hopefully he can answer that for us, because behind the scenes we were wondering if we messed it up, or we consulted with some of our Germanists. They said they weren't sure, so you explain that to us, please. Uh, he grew up in uh, the border region of East Germany, uh, graduated uh, from Braunschweig uh, University, uh, got an MA in history at SUNY Albany, a PhD just down the road in Duckland, the University of Oregon. Uh, he tells me that he likes our campus better. Maybe we can ask him about that. <laughs> uh, he's worked at the Otto von Berke Museum, uh, University in Magdeburg uh, for, for quite a while, teaching American cultural studies and researching the image of the U.S. Uh, in the former GDR. Uh, since 2002, he's taught bilingual history at high school and technical English to engineering students. Uh, he's a 26-year veteran of Aqba Ost, uh, an interested observer of the changes, uh, as he likes to say. Uh, he's active in study abroad programs, um, and is a colleague and a, and a friend of several great historians and intellectuals who I really admire deeply. And one of the first people who told me about his work was uh, an intellectual by the name of Alan Lessoff, who was the editor of the journal of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, was a superb thinker, uh, and said that uh, Thomas Fuchs was the kind of person you absolutely have to have visit if he's around. So that's partly why he's here. Uh, <laughs> and I'm so happy to have you here. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Thank you very much. Thanks for the kind uh, introduction. Um, you know, I, I spent six years in, in, uh, in Eugene at the University of Oregon. I was once here for a basketball game. I uh, didn't even look that much at the campus. I really have to admit this campus is much nicer than the one in Eugene. What? We've got a beautiful uh, 
setting here to, to get your education. Um, the thing with East Germany, small, small E and the big E, it's kind of easy. As long as it was an independent nation until 1990, it's a capitalized E. And since it's just a geographic description, and so it's a small E. Now, the, um, the communist regime had uh, failed in 1990, and uh, consequently the economy, infrastructure, the environment, agriculture, villages and city centers, the social system, ethical values, simply everything was in a catastrophic state in 1990. And East Germans had to come to grips basically overnight with a completely different system of government, of uh, social system, <coughs> of uh, the economy, and so on. For West Germans, everything remained the same. Only that um, uh, West German economy uh, had 16 million additional customers, and um, they also got over the years uh, a million or more qualified workers from East Germany who spoke the language, German, same language, of course. Um, the uh, cost in, of reunification in mon monetary terms since 1990 is absolutely staggering, $2.3 trillion for a former country half the size of Idaho with twice the population of Washington State. So um, uh, what was this money uh, spent on? Why was so much money being spent? Um, I will try to answer that question. I would also like to discuss the uh, psychological impact of the tremendous changes within such a short time period mm -hmm. on the East German population and the social problems that followed and evaluate the long-term consequences of the brain drain. You see, since 1948, East Germans have opted to move to West Germany. Um, by our constitution, every East German who has moved to West Germany was permitted to do so and would immediately become a West German citizen. And the five million people uh, decided to do that and it's quite a lot of people, and um, that has led to a certain brain drain, yeah? that, uh, because mostly the smarter people uh, would uh, leave uh, East Germany. Um, I will also try to explain why the new right-wing party, AFD, Alternative für Deutschland, is particularly strong in East Germany. But first of all, let's talk about where exactly is East Germany. Uh, you have a map here from the, of the German Empire before 1918, and uh, East Germany then was in the middle of Germany, called Central Germany. Yeah? You have uh, in the north Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, in the south you have Sachsen, west of that is Thüringen, but most of those areas were Prussia. Um, after the Second World War, you see all the parts in yellow and uh, pink in the northeastern corner, um, uh, were no longer uh, part of Germany and only then did East Germany really become East Germany because it was the eastern part. Um, East Germany of course was um, occupied by um, the Soviets whereas West Germany um, had three occupation zones in the north the British, in the west the French, and in the south the American zone of occupation. And in 1949 two countries were formed, both West Germany part of um, the Western Alliance, later NATO, a European Union, and East Germany, uh, part of the Warsaw Pact, and uh, also um, the uh, um, East European economic uh, arrangements. When we look at uh, East Germany today, you can see there are five states, uh, Mecklenburg-Vorpommern in the north, um, Brandenburg in the middle, Sachsen in the southeast, Thüringen in the southwest, and uh, Sachsen-Anhalt where I'm from, um, in, in the West. Berlin is a special case. Berlin used to be divided. Berlin became unified, and Berlin is both the capital of Germany and also a separate state. So there was a unification of Berlin and the unification of Germany, and it was decided by a small margin to um, um, change the capital from Bonn over to uh, Berlin in the mid-1990s. Now, the economic situation of East Germany by the late 80s was absolutely catastrophic. 
first of all, they were unable to pay the yearly interest of debt to West German banks. Productivity, industrial productivity, was only at 30 percent of um, uh, the West German level, and deficient five-year plans never worked out. The GDR had an inefficient and bloated bureaucracy. They had to shoulder huge expenses for defense, Soviet occupation forces, border security. Please keep in mind that the Berlin Wall was not just around Berlin, but a similar wall, actually not just the wall, it was an entire installment of border security, fences, uh, mines, uh, you name it, about 200 yards wide across um, the entire border of uh, West and East Germany. Um, you can see in this picture here, this is kind of what a lot of parts of East Germany looked like in 1990, very much run down. And um, the, uh, the problem was that, uh, for example, there were ridiculous subsidies for rental housing. The rents were frozen at 1937 levels, so you would actually pay for an apartment about 20 or 30 East German marks on the black market that would correspond to about $2. Rent. Obviously, you could not fix the homes um, uh, on that kind of rent. Um, also, basic necessities. For example, a lot of East Germans would grow carrots or tomatoes or uh, onions, whatever, in their garden and then would sell them to the state-owned stores. They would get more money for those carrots than what the carrots would later cost in the store. Uh, that's economic nonsense. Um, didn't work out. Public transportation was heavily subsidized. Sports, the older ones among you may remember um, the successes of East German athletes at Olympic Games. Um, and uh, so with all of that together, increasingly there was no more money available, especially hard currency, left for investments into all economic uh, sectors. Wages in East Germany were low, and if you take the black market rate of around four East German marks to one West German mark in account, um, East Germans made about uh, a tenth of what West Germans would make. There was a limited supply of goods in stores. Actually, um, if something was available in the store, you would go, line up, a line would soon form, and then you would buy that and whether you need it or not. Perhaps you could trade it for something else. Yeah? Um, Stereos, luxury items like stereos or television were very expensive and you had to wait 12 years for a new car. But at the same time, there were huge expenses for the uh, concrete slab houses, that housing that you can see here. Um, actually, 1.5 million units, 1.5 million apartments were built between 1972 and 1990. And there was also a lot of money being spent on what the East Germans called international solidarity, support for Cuba, Vietnam, Ethiopia. By the early 1980s, a downward spiral set in that contributed to the implosion of the GDR in 1989-1990. Low productivity, outdated machinery, unrealistic five-year plans, dilapidated housing, polluted environment, decreasing consumer item availability, all of that together led to an increasingly demotivated workforce. Now, problems um, since unification, well, the, the major problem is actually, um, the, as I mentioned before, the brain drain. When you look at these statistics here, in um, 1989 and 1990 alone, 800,000 East Germans left for West Germany. Um, this statistic here you can see in, uh, in yellow the number of um, women and in blue the number of men. And you can see that there were way more women who left East Germany than men. That led to a catastrophic birth rate in the 1990s. I remember when my son was born in 1998, he was, I mean, this was the only birth that day in this huge uh, maternal uh, uh, hospital. <coughs> Um, real um, terrible situation. It has changed in, in the meantime here. Um, the, the real uh, problem was there was no time to restructure the East German economy. It would have taken five to ten years to do that. Instead, privatization was done in less than two years and with a major mistake. 
East Germans who had run these state-owned corporations until 1990 had very few chances to continue to provide their expertise and leadership. Instead, almost all of the East German VEBs, Volkseigener Betrieb, uh, people-owned corporation, uh, went to West German or European Union investors, some of whom turned out to be criminals who received huge government subsidies to rebuild a company and then just disappeared with the money. But most attempts at privatization were honest efforts <coughs> to modernize and continue production. The real problem was the pay level and question of currency. A popular slogan of early 1990 in East Germany had been bring the Deutschmark, the DM, here to us or we will go where the DM rules, meaning West Germany. In 1989 and 1990 alone, almost 800,000 East Germans left for West Germany. By West German law, every East German will be permitted to move to West Germany. If that exodus would continue, basic services in East Germany would collapse, and then the last one to leave will turn off the lights. <laughs> Such were the fears of West German politicians. Therefore, the Deutsche Mark was introduced into East Germany on July 1st, 1990, three months before political unification. From that point on, East German industry and trade were doomed to failure. The first wages in DM, even though they only corresponded to less than 60% of Western wages, made East German products too pricey as productivity averaged only 30%. Consequently, the now privatized VEBs folded and millions lost their jobs between 1990 and 1993. You can see this on this um, graph here. Um, top is uh, un um, unified Germany. The unemployment rate in the middle is uh, uh, West Germany and uh, below is, is East Germany. Uh, keep in mind, East Germany only has a population of 16 million, whereas West Germany has a population of over 60 million. So one million unemployed in East Germany was, was really a lot. Um, <clears throat> besides the social and psychological cost of having a large segment of the population basically losing the lives they knew and being dumped into a completely unfamiliar new social setting, the federal government had to pay huge amounts of money in unemployment benefits, public works programs, health and old age pensions. Now, um, here you have a graph about uh, our uh, national debt in Germany. Yeah? And our national debt doubled from 1990 to 1995. In five years, the national debt doubled. From $550 billion to $1.1 trillion, only to double again to $2.2 trillion by 2010. And uh, at that time, I believe it was around, it was more than 10%, around 15% of the US federal debt. Just imagine, uh, Washington state, twice the population, would have accumulated that much debt in that time. You can also see that since, you know, the high point in uh, 2012, since then, um, uh, our national debt has actually been decreasing. This year, um, we supposedly will have a surplus in the federal budget of about $50 billion. And not all of that goes towards the debt, but, but some of it does. And so we, uh, we're making serious, serious effort to, to reduce uh, the debt that we have accumulated. The total cost of reunification, again, is $2.3 trillion, but only 30% was spent on investments, the remainder on entitlement programs, privatization, and uh, public GDR debts. Um, you can see GDP growth of United Germany, and there's only a couple of years where we had a, uh, a kind of a downer, uh, negative growth. The one a big exception, of course, being 2009, the financial crisis, a more than 5% uh, decrease. Um, the reason for that being our export dependency. Yeah, Germany, a small country as it is, um, is number one exporter in the world, which creates uh, huge problems uh, within the world economy. 
but I don't really want to get into, into that topic here. But you can see we have had relatively healthy growth rates and um, in East Germany in the last six years or so the economy has been good. The problem that we have, persistent low productivity. We start out in 1990 with 30 percent and um, uh, pretty soon we are over 50 uh, but then it kind of stagnates uh, 76 percent of the West German level in 2013 and I believe today it's a little higher than that 78 or 79 percent. In 2005, unemployment in East Germany peaked at an all-time high of 21 percent. The state of Sachsen-Anhalt held a sad record of 24 percent officially in February of 2005. I read recently in the newspaper that the actual unemployment rate of Sachsen-Anhalt in 2005 was 42 percent. Yeah, when you discount all the uh, public works projects, etc. In um, yeah, since then unemployment has consistently decreased to around um, uh, six percent for East Germany as a whole, seven point five percent in Sachsen-Anhalt, Thüringen, and Sachsen, the mo southernmost states are below 5% as of August 2018. The industrial base has been expanded, of course automobiles and suppliers, renewable energies, heavy machinery, chemicals, information technology and so on. But mostly these are only the production sites. The research and development and company headquarters are usually located in the West. So that means that there's fewer people with really high income and a very good education working in East Germany because mostly that's just the production side. Small business has been booming since 2013 and a lot of craftsmen, yeah, electricians, plumbers and so on, have more work now than they can handle. Actually, we now have a serious labor shortage in East Germany as all over, East, uh, as all over Germany. Okay, agriculture. I know this is a land-grant school and uh, you have a lot of uh, fields where all kinds of research is being done. So uh, I'd also like to talk a little bit about uh, agriculture in East Germany as it fits here. You can see a picture here of a biogas facility. We have a lot of biogas facilities. They usually run on um, corn or a mixture of corn and uh, manure. They're heavily subsidized by the government. Um, but they provide uh, a lot of um, um, money for the farmers in uh, Germany or East Germany. Another source of income would be windmills. The windmills are located uh, on the farmland. Uh, it's not a big problem for the farmers, you know, it's just a small spot where they cannot farm. And um, that also provides a lot of money and not just for the farmers, but also for the villages that are located near the windmills because they have to give their okay. They have to say, yes, we, we agree that you can put the windmills there. And so that means that um, roads or, or, or lights or the local kindergarten in the village will get um, some kind of money. In Germany or in the European Union, farmers get about 50% of their income either through the European Union or through uh, the German federal government. So we heavily subsidize our agriculture. Um, traditionally, farms are much larger in East Germany than in the West. Often Junker estates, like the one owned by Otto von Bismarck, I'm sure you've heard about, in the Altmark, about 50 miles north of Magdeburg. After World War II, the Junkers were expropriated and the land was given to small farmers, first who later more or less voluntarily joined the new agricultural cooperatives called LPG. Landwirtschaftliche Produktionsgenossenschaft, beautiful word. Um, after 1958, collectivization became mandatory, which led to an exodus of farmers until August 13, 1961, when the wall was being built. One of the major reasons actually um, uh, this event happened, because without the farmers, East Germany would have been lost. Soon the LPGs functioned relatively well and were able to feed the East German population after the mid-60s increasingly with pork and chicken meat. 
but there was a huge deficit in the food stores in regard to fresh fruit and vegetables, not to mention citrus and bananas. Yeah? Bananas were very hard to get in East Germany. Um, I'm showing you a few photos here of the countryside. Here, for example, <coughs> you have the small town of Tangermünde on the Elbe River, about 50 miles north of Magdeburg, and this was the site, um, the, uh, the summer residence of Emperor Charles IV in the late 1300s, for example. Another scene from, from village uh, life here. Um, Today, the former LPGs are a success story because they are able to produce cheaper than in the West on account of the size of the farms. This was only made possible because the LPGs laid off around 90% of their staff since 1990, which has led to sharply declined employment opportunity in the rural areas. The landscape west of Magdeburg, called Börde, is very rich wheat-growing country but soils in other areas are rocky, sandy, or swampy and yield lower harvests of barley and potatoes, but also white asparagus, a local specialty. Um, my, uh, my professor at uh, um, uh, University of Oregon always told me, crops never fail in the Willamette Valley. <laughs> yeah, the soil is great, there's always enough rain, so there's no problem with that. And um, also you have a wonderful variety of all kinds of, uh, from mint to, to grass seed to um, strawberries, raspberries, all kinds of fruit. Um, very impressive, the agricultural region here. Um, many uh, agricultural businesses make uh, significant extra income from renewable energies. I showed you that before. So also solar panels on barns. Because of green energies, capital is invested into areas that would otherwise not see such investment. This also means financial support for village infrastructure, for clubs, or the local kindergarten. Uh, in this way, Germany tries to fight the danger of ghost villages, keep rural regional culture and accents alive. There's actually a program in Sachsen-Anhalt to promote regional accents. Believe it or not. Um, in the villages, we have inexpensive housing, natural landscapes with forests, and ancient tree-lined cobblestone roads abound. Now, um, most villages are around a thousand years old and feature churches, you see them here now, that actually date back to 1000 AD. Um, such a 1,000-year-old church is still the largest building in the village which often has not seen much new construction of homes since the 1930s. Most of the old wooden frame or brick buildings have been restored. Quality of life in the villages has improved and some young families return to rural life. Um, I actually take, with my friend Christian, we take a lot of bicycle trips um, through um, um, the area north of um, uh, Magdeburg and uh, it's um, quite amazing how much uh, history you find in every single village. The cobblestone roads are still there, they are lined with old ancient trees and so on. Unfortunately, the brain drain remains a big problem, especially in the countryside. Because of the persistent farewell of young East Germans until about 2010, the social structure of the population is different than in West Germany. Instead of a strong, solid, educated middle class level of about 25% in the West and a low level of the underclass, people who have no apprenticeship, no skills, bad manners, um, East Germany features the opposite. Clearly it is more challenging to create a functioning economy and participatory democracy when a quarter of the population is uh, dysfunctional slight exaggeration on, on my part here. The unfortunate social structure of the East German population today has also led to an increased support for right-wing populist parties. And you can see here the results of our federal elections in 2017. The CDU, that's Angela Merkel's party, in contrast to what you hear uh, currently from the current administration who claim they're 
Merkel is extremely liberal. Merkel is conservative, actually, in German standards. So the CDU is still the, the largest party, Merkel's party, almost 27%. The SPD, that's the, the Social Democrats, uh, 20%. And then you have, as number three, this new party, the Alternative für Deutschland, the AFD. Uh, you also have the FDP, this would be a traditional Republican pro-business party. Linke is, is a leftist party, just left of the Social Democrats, who used to be the Communists. Then we have the Greens, the Greens are usually very strong. Right now um, they are they're estimated at being at 13 <coughs> or 15 percent according to the latest polls. Now, we also had a, uh, state elections in Sachsen-Anhalt in 2016, and here it's, you see a different story. Again, the CDU is the largest party, but the <coughs> AFD is the second largest party in our regional parliament at 24%. And, um, well, that's not very nice. Mm, unfortunately, we have, you know, we've had a huge influx of um, refugees in 2015 and 2016 over one million people came, um, mostly from um, places like uh, Syria, Afghanistan, uh, but also Northern Africa, Somalia, basically you name it, all kinds of countries, some from Pakistan and so on. And um, unfortunately, there has been um, uh, quite a strong uh, reaction against these newcomers. There were just too many um, coming at the, uh, at the same time. And um, you can see here on, on this um, uh, statistics here um, how um, Germany tried to um, divide all the newcomers all over the country. Yeah? Uh, rural areas, urban areas, um, not just in the west but also in the east and it goes according to population. So even the small village where I live um, had f uh, at some point 200 uh, refugees and um, um, some, some people, um, uh, including myself, uh, org organized um, education, yeah, like, like German classes and all kinds of other things. And um, so did, I think, about 10 million Germans participated in this. Um, here you can see the Ausländerquote, uh, the number percentage of foreigners in the various states. And you can see that uh, whereas in, in Hessen, Frankfurt is, uh, you have 15% foreigners, and in Sachsen-Anhalt you have 3.7%. Yeah? So very, very low number of foreigners before 2015 and 16, and they were mostly concentrated in the large cities. In the countryside, there were no foreigners at all. And uh, unfortunately, there were a number of um, um, crimes uh, uh, committed. Now, um, don't get uh, the wrong idea here. I'm not talking about uh, murders or, or serious uh, injuries or whatever. It's mostly propaganda, meaning uh, graffiti or, or whatever. But you can see that East Germany um, is uh, much, has a much higher uh, percentage of, uh, of these attacks uh, towards foreigners than, than West Germany. And um, here you have another map, um, uh, West Germany, East Germany by counties and large urban areas. And again, you can see that the only areas where you do have significant foreign population is in, in the cities and uh, not in the uh, countryside. Unfortunately, um, uh, seven weeks ago, I think, in, in Chemnitz, which is located in Sachsen, there were right-wing protests after a, um, a crime had been committed that ended in the death of a German person, and uh, several thousand uh, uh, soccer hooligans, uh, professional Nazis um, gathered from, from all over East Germany and West Germany. You know, smartphones make it possible for that to happen. And um, uh, foreigners were chased uh, through the streets. There was an attack upon a Jewish restaurant uh, in Chemnitz. Real ugly scenes. Um, but uh, a little bit later, uh, a couple of days later, a concert against fascism was organized and there were 65,000 mostly young people um, who uh, were involved and uh, who protested um, against uh, this kind of uh, 
Nazi activity. The Zeitgeist, this is a German term here, has changed for sure. All over Europe, right-wing hate mongers have seats in Parliament. Hungary and Poland are heading in the direction of a fascist dictatorship. Italy and Austria have populists in government, as do a host of other European nations. So this is not just an East German problem. But 57 years of dictatorship, yeah, remember the Nazi period and then the communist period, it's from uh, 1933 to 1990, have left an imprint as did the social upheavals of the 1990s. But in contrast to the 1990s, economic misery is no longer an excuse for violent excesses. The vicious anti-immigrant crowds that are instantly mobilized um, who come from all over Germany to wherever there may be some action developing are, I would say, are brain drain leftovers. And the anti-immigrant policies of the Bavarian CSU, yeah, in Bavaria you don't have the CDU, you have the CSU, uh, poured gasoline on the already existing flames of uh, discontent. We will see in the future if our law enforcement and civil society will be able to lay the right-wing spook to rest. Next thing concerns the environment. Um, as I said before, East Germany was extremely polluted. Here you have a map of SO2, sulfur dioxide, and you can see that was mostly concentrated in East Germany in the southern part of Sachsen-Anhalt, the northern part of Saxony incredibly high pollution. Um, here you can see that um, the brown areas are where soft coal was being mined. Um, in the western area, potassium and uranium mining. The first nuclear bombs of the Soviet Union were, the uranium for it, was mined in East Germany. Yeah. Um, in the next uh, graph, you can see how SO2 emissions have decreased since 1990, basically by 90%. And it's the same for a lot of other um, dangerous materials like heavy metals um, uh, and others. Um, the, uh, this is kind of what uh, East Germany looked like before the war came down. And these are before and after pictures. This is the same kind of area afterwards. Or you can see this one here, before 1990. This is the same shot now, or this one here. This is what it looks now. This, uh, yeah, <laughs> this uh, was again before 1990, and now this is a real lake. And I like this one here best. You can see a city and the smog and the chimneys and everything, and this is what it looks today. So um, a lot has been cleaned up, but um, of course uh, um, the, uh, the millions of jobs that were lost, you know, the positive side effect was cleanup of the environment. So the GDR was heavily polluted and increasingly so over the years as necessary investments on cleaner production techniques were not made due to lack of funds. The problems concern especially the low-grade, high-sulfur soft coal as sole source for electric energy. Yeah, they couldn't afford uh, the oil, um, they couldn't afford the gas that West Germany got through pipelines that went through East Germany. The East Germans could have used the gas for, for heating instead of coal, but they didn't have the money for it. And so the investments on cleaner production techniques were not made due to lack of funds. So we have um, central heating systems were based on um, soft coal ovens in older homes. We're talking about millions of ovens in older homes uh, would use this uh, um, really low-grade coal. There are hundreds of cold-out pits in East Germany, moonscapes, and... Um, a lot of that uh, had to be changed. The chemical industry around Halle, Merseburg, Leuna, Bitterfeld, Wolfen, again the area um, Sachsen, Anhalt, Sachsen, produced enormous amounts of polluted air, water, and soils. And of course, millions of stinky two stroke automobiles, the Trabant, Trabi, yeah, 
<laughs> and the Wartburg um, that ran on a mixture of oil and gasoline. Compared to those blue smoke vehicles, a Volkswagen diesel is a clean car. <laughs> um, another problem was the over-fertilization of fields and thus groundwater contamination with nitrates in areas of huge meat-producing LPGs. The successes after 1990. The unfortunate loss of millions of industrial jobs had the fortunate side effect that within a few years, rivers, lakes, and the air quality had markedly improved because most of the old polluting plants had been closed down. Also, modern wastewater treatment plants were installed all over East Germany and in heavily industrialized Czech area of northern Bohemia that also used to pollute the Elbe River. More than 200 former soft coal mining pits were renaturalized at enormous cost, but offer now freshly planted forests, marinas, and lakefront housing. <laughs> the uranium sites in the south were cleaned up nicely and even featured a federal garden show. The former border strip, 200 yards wide, has been declared green ribbon and forms a 500 mile long nature reserve along the former border. Today, East German homes feature modern heating and weatherization of the, uh, the houses and consequently use less heating energy. The challenges that remain include ever increasing automobile and truck traffic, you know, like you have here in America, especially diesel automobiles and delivery trucks are at the root of air quality problems in the large cities. So the success is today, rivers and lakes are clean. Even the Elbe River that used to be the most polluted river in Europe perhaps um, and endemic fish like salmon have all been reintroduced into the rivers and thrive. Actually, the area around Magdeburg is great for fishing. No? And fish ladders have been installed, even though we don't have as many um, uh, hydroelectric dams as you have here. The air quality in most regions of the east is better than in the west. Areas with contaminated soils have been thoroughly excavated, cleaned up, and prepared for future usage. The highway and autobahn network has been renewed and expanded. Bypasses around towns were built. Two new high-speed railroad lines have been completed. Berlin-Hanover, already 20 years ago, and Berlin-Munich, just last year. Many other railroad lines have been modernized and electrified, so that even the regional trains do up to 100 miles per hour on longer stretches. Um, the high-speed railroads have just been reduced the speed because we don't have such long um, stretches where they run, so they change from high speed to um, high acceleration once they get out of the trains. So now they only do about, uh, what is it, 160 miles per hour. Um, Soon the federal government will invest heavily into bicycle superhighways, yes, that will eventually offer paved pathways independent from the roads between major cities that regularly connect with railroad stations. Mm -hmm. Actually, even today, like where I live, I live in this village just east of Magdeburg, when I literally go outside of my house, I have the choice of three bicycle um, trails in three different directions that are completely independent from any kind of automobile infrastructure. And they go through um, park landscape and forest and meadows and all of that. There are many birds of prey, lots of deer and wild boars. It's a real problem with, uh, I mean, I ran into one boar and a deer uh, like you know, a year and a half ago. You really have to be careful when you go through forests. You have to go real slow and be very careful. And even wolves have been reestablished and thrive. Mm -hmm. Wolves um, are very controversial. I could do an entire presentation just on wolves. Mm -hmm. uh, we're having about 150 now in, in Sachsen-Anhalt alone. A friend of mine has seen one. Uh, I've seen a, an eaten out sheep yeah, that a wolf, wolf has devoured half a mile away from where I live. So there are wolves um, very close to, to where I live. 
Um, natural habitats of rare animals are increasingly uh, protected by legislation and courts. Okay, now I would final point in my presentation is the architectural heritage and city planning. As you all know, after the Second World War, German cities were destroyed. <coughs> Here we have the um, Reichstag in Berlin. You can see around the Reichstag there was nothing left. And only because the Reichstag is such a sturdy structure. Uh, actually, yesterday when I saw the, the county court of here in Corvallis, I couldn't help but feel reminded <laughs> by the Reichstag. Maybe the Reichstag is a little bigger, but same kind of era, same kind of idea, I would say. Um, in, in the late 90s, the Reichstag was uh, completely redone, but before it was redone, two artists um, had the idea to wrap the Reichstag. Yeah? So here you have wrapped Reichstag in uh, cloth, this kind of silver shining cloth. I went there when this happened. Uh, incredible, absolutely incredible. You cannot imagine um, uh, what it looked like, like some kind of uh, spaceship that had landed. <laughs> and um, yeah, but uh, that was only for a couple of months. And then, uh, of course, the uh, Reichstag uh, was renewed and received a new dome. Yeah? The rest is basically the way it was being built in the 1870s, but uh, with a new dome. In 1999, in 1991, the federal government introduced a new law entitled the Preservation of Urban Historical Districts. It provided funds under the condition that restoration had to be done according to historic monument rules, and that means restored to its original state. That means, for example, you have an old house, it's totally dilapidated, you don't even know what the original color was, then uh, in the laboratory, you would take samples of the color and then you figure out what the exact color was and that color would be used to repaint that building. Uh, all the windows, all the doors, everything would be done uh, according to what it used to be. Of course, not the same materials, not made out of wood, but some kind of uh, plastic. But still, it looks exactly like uh, it used to. You will still have some, some photos of... Um, yeah, this is an example, yeah. This was the, uh, you can s see, well, this is in the middle of Berlin, and this used to be kind of the death zone right next to the border, and so it's all been built up now. Uh, Berlin is basically 98% finished. Magdeburg maybe 85%, but getting there. Here you can see the way it used to look before, yeah. You had all these stretches. West Germany is to the east, and East Germany, uh, in this case, uh, to the one. Well, right, East Germany to the left, yeah, and the East Germans would have taken the remaining houses away so that they would have a clear view of all that uh, uh, border region. So the government and the European Union provided enormous amounts of funds to stop and reverse the decay of historic urban districts and at the same time create good jobs for many of the unemployed in the construction and the reconstruction industry. Also, huge tax breaks were given to investors, which led to a short-lived boom in new housing and commercial buildings in the mid-90s. By 2000, an oversupply of new and newly restored older homes had accumulated, and that was also the impact of a decreasing population. For example, um, in Magdeburg from 380,000 in 1938, to 280,000 in 1988, to 225,000 in 2008, today 242,000 and growing. All over East Germany, the government provided funds or bounties to the housing cooperatives to tear down the ugliest concrete slab buildings in order to normalize the real estate market. In Magdeburg, so far, around 15,000 out of 50,000 concrete slab apartments have been demolished. The cooperatives in Magdeburg, for example, mm -hmm. own 55,000 of 95,000 rental units and thus keep rents down. They build new, mostly Bauhaus-style apartments in cooperation with city planning commissions and usually erect tasteful new buildings that fit nicely into the existing surroundings. Now I'm just going to explain to you a few of the photos I have here. This is 1950s East German housing that was built. They put a lot of effort into that. 
actually real kind of pretty. This is a former Stalin Allee, yeah? Buildings in the Stalin Allee, 1950s. In the 1960s, well, the buildings get a little more bland, and by the 70s and 80s, um, first they would build the houses, and then it took another 10 years for, you know, plant some trees and uh, lawn and whatever. So this was an adventure playing ground for the children. Yeah. Okay, and this, of course, is um, uh, Bundeskanzleramt. This is where Angela Merkel does her governing. And you get another picture here of um, central Berlin. You can see the Reichstag way up there in the corner, and all the new buildings were being created. And this is a new train station, the new Hauptbahnhof in Berlin. Okay, now let's get to, to Magdeburg. This is the oldest building in Magdeburg. 700-year-old monastery. This is a 600-year-old cathedral. And uh, here you have some examples of Baroque architecture it has been restored. Unfortunately, most of the inner city was destroyed in one bomb attack in January of 1945. This is an interesting place. It's kind of the party area of Magdeburg. Um, uh, this is uh, built in the 1880s. You can see this is the original 1900. This is after the war. Yeah, a lot of buildings had been destroyed. And this is uh, today when most of these uh, buildings have been restored to the original splendor. Actually, I was told that in the 1880s, there were only two cities in the world that had more expensive real estate than this year in Magdeburg, and they were New York and London. Be um, the reasons to, it takes too long to explain this. This is another Victorian building of the time period, 1880s. And then we have Jugendstil. Again, lots of buildings in Magdeburg, beautifully restored. And the specialty of the buildings in Magdeburg is color, very bright colors everywhere. Now, my favorites are the 1920s buildings. This is what they looked like before um, they were restored. This is what they looked like after they were restored. These are all buildings um, built between 1923, 24, and 1934. And no other um, city has as many um, re um, uh, it, uh, in relation to the total number of apartments. Yeah? And actually, most of the, uh, what's being built in, in Germany now is kind of this Bauhaus style. It also had to do with, uh, with social democracy. I was more leftist approach. Actually, the, the first thing the Nazis did in 1933 was they passed a law that outlawed flat roofs because they were international, not German enough. This is the um, uh, convention hall in Magdeburg, built in 1927. It's going to be um, redone for $100 million. And uh, Magdeburg is applying to become a Europe's uh, cultural capital. This is a very strange Nazi building. Um, this was supposed to honor the SS. It doesn't have any windows or whatever. There was supposed to be a shrine in there. It was also redone, but then closed. And somebody threw away the key, so nobody <laughs> enters this here. 1950s, very similar what you have in Berlin. Yeah? Again, this is Magdeburg. The Stalinists, we call them the sugar baker style. Yeah? Actually pretty. And um, this was a road that was completely destroyed during the uh, Second World War. You can see this here. And was rebuilt in the 1960s um, with those kind of buildings. You have an aerial view of uh, Magdeburg, another 1960s building. This is uh, the f one of the first um, um, uh, parts of the new city built in the north in the 1970s with high rise buildings. This is what it looks today. And here you can see how you take down these buildings. It's like Legos, you know? You can put them like Legos together, and if you don't want them anymore, you just take them apart again. Uh, this is what it looked like when they're being built. Actually, when they are six stories high, as in this case, they're called five plus one. They had a lawn East Germany with six stories. You have to have an elevator. 
but they didn't have money for elevators towards the end. So they called them five plus one, no elevator needed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no elevator, okay. Um, this is today, we have this, um, this boulevard, this um, kind of um, walk way for, for pedestrians and for bicyclists along the river. It's been done to completely new, there was industry before, and it stretches the entire um, river for about uh, five miles. It's really nice. Yeah, this was the one we had. <laughs> And uh, this is an example for new architecture. This is uh, Friedensreich Hundertwasser. His, um, the last building is kind of comparable perhaps to, to what Gaudi did in Barcelona a hundred years ago. And you see from, from above that um, this is um, you know, lots of green and trees and, uh, and whatever. Um, okay, uh, I, come, I come to a close now. And um, one thing I would like to say, we're the Asian American student room here, um, I really hope that um, Korea, the two Koreas, uh, will embark on a similar journey, perhaps uh, sometime, hopefully soon in, in the future. And um, yeah, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And, uh,